Merry Christmas, everyone. It's a great delight for me to be able to look out and see all of you gathered here today, especially after this long, dry, tumultuous season that we've had for the almost last two years with all of the suffering, the loss, the trials, the difficulties that we've all experienced in one way or another. And so to gather here today to worship the Lord on this holy day, the fact that you're here is a great blessing for you, for the Lord, for the church, and for all of us who serve. But we want to ask ourselves just what are we doing here today? What, what's this all about? Is this the end of the shopping season? Is this, what is this? What is, what is the purpose of our day? And as Catholics, we love visual and sensory symbols and ways of experiencing things through our senses. So we have the manger, the creche. This was given to us by St. Francis of Assisi. He was the first one who created this creche, the manger, to be able to represent this event. We have the poinsettias. We have the Christmas trees with the lights. We have all the decorations that you see around us, all designed to kind of lift our senses to say something different is happening today. What is it? And there are a lot of notions about what Christmas are, is about. And not all of them are wrong, but there, some, many of them are incomplete. So for example, some people think that Christmas is really all about family, and it's the time for family reunions. And even those lost sheep who don't have much contact find their way home on Christmas. That's a great thing. Reuniting the family, especially if there have just been estrangement or distances of, of, of space and time. That's a great thing, but there's got to be something more. Others talk about the, the spirit of Christmas. So the Hallmark Channel is full of all these movies that they spend all this money on trying to create what they call some ubiquitous or some amb it's ambiguous, I should say, concept, abstract concept known as the spirit of Christmas. Again, not bad, but there's got to be something, something more there. Um, some Christians even see this as a really elaborate birthday party. You know, we're throwing this huge birthday party for Jesus, and so we're all going to get together and, and, you know, really pull the stops and have a great time with that. None of those things are wrong, but they're just incomplete. Because what we're doing, my brothers and sisters, is we are acknowledging that God, who created everything, humbled himself to become part of the creation. There are some religions who mock us for believing that because it's so incredible. It goes against everything that we would uh, intuitively think about who God is. Why would God become one of his creation? Well, first of all, he promised to do that. And he's a promise keeper. God is a promise keeper. He doesn't break his promises. Throughout the entire Old Testament, beginning with Adam and Eve, he promised that he would send a redeemer, a Messiah, someone who could lift us out of our sins, someone who could break the bonds of sin and darkness and give us light. So the whole Old Testament is a story of God preparing his people. And then in the fullness of time, he fulfills that promise by sending his son, Jesus. There was this commercial on one of the movies I was watching. It was a, it was a preview. It said, and starts out, 20 years ago, a child was born who will change the world. And I wanted to put it on stop. Wait a minute. No, not 20, no. That, add two more zeros. 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, a child was born who has changed the world. Then and only then and no more. So he came in order to fulfill the promise that God had made to us. We are the beneficiaries of that promise fulfilled. Second, the second reason why he came is to show you and I the value of what it means to be a human person. 
Now, that should be self-evident, but it's not. In our day today, there are a lot of people who see us as nothing more than animals, maybe, you know, above chimpanzees and below dolphins somewhere on the spectrum. Um, I don't know about you, but we are definitely higher than all of the other sentient beings in the, in, the, in the world because God has created us with an eternal soul. Yes, we're rational animals. That's a, that's a philosophical definition, but we've been given an eternal soul. And so even when we die, we continue to exist with this eternal soul. And so what Jesus comes to say is, I'm going to become one of you to show you the dignity that you possess as a human person made in God's image and likeness. And then he also comes to say that I want to create a family. And just as we value family, yes, we have our issues and we, we get together and it's challenging and there are all these difficulties that exist in every family. There's nothing more supportive and more important than family. We know that in, from our own experience. And God is saying the same thing because God is a family, Father, Son, and Spirit. And he says, I want you to be a part of my family. And the only way you can acquire membership into my family is through my son, Jesus. So that's what God has done. He sent his son so that we could be members of his family. Those are, those are the main reasons. There are many more. But I want to do something that is kind of different because I, I want to uh, use an image to help us to understand this. Any of you have had the privilege of traveling to the great cathedrals in Europe and you've looked at the architecture and the art in these cathedrals, they're not, they're not haphazard. They're there as a way to teach people. It's only been 500 years that universal literacy, well, it's not even, I mean, only in the recent last hundred years, universal literacy has, has come about, but only in the last 500 years has it, been has it been possible for others to read who are not monks or, or specially educated. And so the way the church taught its beliefs and its doctrines and its teachings was through art and architecture. And it's, this is especially true in the Eastern church with their icons. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the nativity icon. As you can see, this is the, the typical uh, Russian Orthodox nativity icon. And there are some elements in it I th that I think are very important for us to see if we're going to be able to understand. Let's see if my pointer will arrive. It does. Thanks be to God. Okay, so we see the angels up there rejoicing, rejoicing at the coming of the Messiah. And then we have an angel over here. I'll point over here. We have an angel over here who is telling the shepherds that the Messiah has arrived. And then we have the three wise men, so it, it, here's the epiphany as well. This is all contained in this, in this icon. And then the largest figure is, of course, Mary. She, is, she, she overpowers the icon uh, in proportion, and there's a reason for that. And it's because she's the one, the Theotokos, the one who brings God into the world. But notice what she's doing. Ordinarily, whenever you see Mary, she's looking at Jesus, but not in this icon. In this icon, she's not looking at Jesus. She's looking at Joseph. Because Joseph is now being told by the devil that he should doubt who is the father of this child. And so Mary is looking at Joseph, consoling him, consoling him. And then we have Jesus. And if you, you see that what's behind him looks oddly and strangely like a tomb. And he's wrapped up in burial cloths. And he's in a... In a bassinet that really looks like a casket. Now, was that an artistic flaw? Or is there something that the artist is telling us? 
that Jesus came into the world in order to die for our sins. That's why he was born. So that you and I could be free of sin and bondage. That we could overcome the powers of darkness that seek to destroy us and lure us away from the love of God. And so, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging concept, but it really is the meaning of Christmas. So yeah, there's no Rudolph or Frosty in the, in the icon, but it's nonetheless, this is, this represents what this is all about. And so my concept is this, that if you really want to, to uh, impress your friends, next year you'll send them a Christmas card with this on it. And they may send it back to you. And ask, or ask you, what does it mean? And you can tell them, I'm sending you a Christmas card that says, the Messiah has come to die for our sins. And when he did that, we became free men and free women if we accept the gift and the power of his Holy Spirit. That, my brothers and sisters, is Christmas. It's not what you're going to hear or see. Every Christmas they trot out these, these stories such as who wrote the Old Testament, is, who was Jesus, who were his apostles. I don't need to watch those because I know who. It's right in the Bible. We, all, those are, all those are designed to provoke doubt. But if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, that's all. And we believe that he is who he says who he is, and we belong to him. Merry Christmas, everybody.